given you my heart and all that is within I lay it all down for the sake of you my king I've given you my dreams I'm laying down my rights I'm giving up my pride for the promise of you and I surrender all to you, all to So, it's by uh, Vineyard. It's just another one of those songs that I've known for a long time, and we haven't done it before. And coincidentally, coincidentally, it, we just talked about that last week, and it's come up, the topic has come up a lot. The character of surrender. What comes out of us in demonstrating surrender, basically devotions, different sermons and things, discussions. But it, it makes me think about in the garden. I think we've mentioned it before, but in the garden, in Eden, in the beginning, man walked with God in perfection, right? But they fell in choosing to not obey God, right? In heaven, we will be walking with God in perfection, essentially. We're not told in scripture that there's any possibility of not obeying God, of not of falling from heaven. Does that mean it's, you know, the argument from silence that it's not possible? Is it a possibility? We're just not told. I don't think so, because we're told we'll be there for eternity. So the implication is that there's no, there's nowhere else to go. There's nothing else that can happen. We will just be with God in glory in his presence, in with fullness of joy, at his right hand, with pleasures forevermore, forevermore, eternal life. We can't suddenly be outside of God's grace. Just like we can't be here, it's not going to happen in heaven. Point being, what's the difference? <laughs> why was it bought? Why will it be impossible for us to desire to be away from God in heaven? Why will it be impossible to disobey? Will we just cease to have free will? Will, we, will it be ripped out of us, any curiosity of something more than God? I think, I think it's, this is my understanding, Specula it's entirely speculative. In the garden, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were 
exposed to and understood the reality of good and evil, as we do here. Now, as C.S. Lewis would say, there's no conceptualization, no realization, no understanding of a crooked stick without a straight stick. You have to know the ruler, the principle, the directive before you can understand what it means to oppose that or warp that. You have to have the thing before you can have something other than the thing. Otherwise, it's just another thing. <laughs> but anyway, so you have to have perfection and good and understand that before there will be any reality to something that is evil, something that is not good. But all Adam and Eve understood was what they knew, and it wasn't good or bad, it was just what they knew, what they experienced. Whereas now we have the understanding of right and wrong, and it was just that they didn't trust God enough, they trusted somebody else other than God to influence what they knew. And that was contrasted with Abraham, like, or it is contrasted with Abraham, like we talked about last week, or before. <laughs> he obeyed. God said, sacrifice your son to me. And he could have said no. Or he could have done it begrudgingly as a, as a hateful subordinate. Because he's my boss. Or he could have done it. Understanding God promised my son would be the fulfillment of the promise. Or it would come through him. So even if my son dies, he's going to bring him back to life. So it's no big, no biggie. Sure, we'll do it. And, and you know, you'll, you'll work things out, which the more you think about it is just a crazy, crazy, awesome, crazy good, you know, perspective to have. So no wonder he was a man of faith. But anyway, and he was counted as righteous. But the doing the hard thing and back to Colossians, back to the whole surrender and suffering, counting the world as lost, as garbage for the sake of Christ, suffering for one another and to grow and all that. The understanding of the two sides, to choose God and his sovereignty, to trust God and his perfection, as opposed to leaning on our own understanding, thinking we can surmise or, or or of our own volition, our own thinking, do the best thing in the midst of suffering or in the midst of temptation. Our desire to do the good thing makes the bad thing and then, and then the consequence of the good, meaning God's will coming to pass in the midst of the bad, makes the bad more than just bad, right? I think we all understand that, but if there was no God's plan, <laughs> if there was no sharing in the sufferings of Christ coming after him in his preeminence, following after him in what he did in his example, if there was no bearing the burdens of life, doing hard things, and that achieving something of eternal value, of godliness, then the bad things would be only worth suffering. And so they wouldn't be worth doing at all. Because who wants that? Who wants to suffer? Who wants to experience pain? So our obedience to God, surrender, to choose him, to obey, makes our service, our worship, all the more real for us, all the more meaningful for us, because of what it costed, per se, as opposed to just loving him and serving him in the good stuff, which will be heaven. So coming back to Abraham, again, it wasn't that when God said, now I know that you'll do anything, now that now I know you, you have faith, you're faithful to me. It wasn't that God suddenly knew something new. It was Abraham coming to the realization himself and understanding what God did because of his obedience. That made it more real and more meaningful for Abraham. So when we get to heaven, we won't need to experience, we won't need to desire something outside of God, outside of perfection, outside of everything, because we've already experienced it here. We already understand, having gone through this life, 
the, as we talked about with Job, the intended end of God. And he'll, he'll take away the sin. He'll take away the evil. But we will remember, just as Jesus bears the scars of his death for our sins, I think we will bear the understanding, just as we do here, that we're there by his grace. There will be nothing else to want, and there will be no reason to want it because we've already experienced it here. And, and we're made perfect, we're, we're, we'll know as we are known, and we'll have eternity to spend enjoying the consequences of experiencing this life. God has given us all things to enjoy. Seeing in color, totally unnecessary, yet we have it. Pleasure, unnecessary, but he loves us and he wants us to experience love, the relationship, the good not just like Adam and Eve, or again, it's speculative, but it's like they just did stuff and they knew. I'm sure there was pleasure. I'm sure there was enjoyment, relaxation, but it, it's different. Understanding the suffering, understanding the evil, and then in heaven to have the fullness of goodness with the understanding of everything that is outside of God. That's when we get to the, the picture of liberty, freedom, being within boundaries. That's why we enjoy all things as he's given them to us to enjoy within boundaries because there is no need to understand anything else because this is all that matters. And everything else is bad. So we don't need everything else. That's why there, it doesn't have to be true that there's a first time for everything. It doesn't have to be true that, well, you got to experience this in order for it to be meaning. You know, we don't have to know the full weight of uh, the full dread of sin and, and evil because we've seen it on the cross. We have experienced it to a degree in different degrees for each person in our lives. And that little bit knowing the little bit of evil and seeing the full grace of God, the full wrath of God in Jesus should be, you know, experience enough for us, should be understanding enough. And then we'll be able to experience fully ourselves in heaven, of course. But anyway, it was just something that's been in, in my head and, and, and it should be an encouragement to us to keep the faith to maintain the integrity of obedience. Not just for show, not just, oh, he's God, I guess so, but that we actually desire to do according to his word, will according to his word, and that it would make all of the things that we experience, good or bad, have eternal, eternal in the sense of time, value, an eternal value, infinite value in the sense that it is worth everything and so much more and it will never cease to be worth everything and so much you know for eternity to miss that i think is is the epitome of of pride and of unbelief because you would rather choose what i want what i think i should have over what god knows and desires for us to know is really worth everything just a little time here not not to make light of the things that we experience here it's very real but that reality that being so real should encourage us to want to all the more desire to be apart from it and to be with god and he gives those things more meaning than just suffering bad evil he gives it more than just, it's difficult. <laughs> and that makes even those things of eternal value. That's why he can redeem sin, but God. But yeah, I, I think that's it. Anyway, this is a little bit longer. There's a lot of stuff. Like, there's not a lot to it, but there's so much stuff that comes into that idea and there have been some changes lately and i'm going to attempt by the grace of god to keep this up consistently and 
with the same, I guess, prompting. But we'll see what happens. Life is not so predictable. But we just do what God tells us to do. And let him worry about what happens. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the video and do it and then, uh, and then move on. Okay, so <laughs> that's it. <laughs> we'll be in Colossians next week if the Lord should tarry. Uh, good song. Anyway, yeah. You've seen the connection with the song and everything I was saying. So I won't explain it, but yeah. Okay, bye. <laughs>